Um, we've got our readers, we've got our audience. We're ready for more poetry. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with Francis Boyle, and I'm going to keep my intros short and sweet because we've got two features, and we're getting about 15 minutes from each of them. Um, but I won't take up my time with my own voice. Um, so Francis Boyle, um, Francis Boyle's most recent recent book is Open Work and Limestone, her third poetry collection, which I learned when she arrived is almost almost available, but not quite it's so close. But she does have some wonderful um, little poem cards and um, a bunch of other books out there. Um, previous books include the White This White Nest, a poetry collection, Tower, a novella and Seeking Shade, an award-winning short story collection, which I believe are all up there on that table, so you can check those out afterwards. Her writing has been published internationally, raised on the prairies Francis has long lived in Ottawa. Welcome, Francis. Oh, thank you. I'll just check the height before I go sit down. Uh, how's that? that Sound okay? Great. Thank you so much, Zoe. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I'm really happy to be back in Victoria and back at Planter Poetry, and I'm delighted to be reading with Catherine again. Um, so the bit of the sales pitch, as Zoe said, my book is not here yet. It's close. Uh, but I have some little postcards that you're welcome to take. And my publisher has said because of this, he uh, will cover the postage of anybody who wants to buy either a signed copy from me or an unsigned copy directly from the publisher. So I'm going to start by reading from uh, The Swite Nest, a few poems from it. I was scheduled to read here in May 2020 with my then brand new book. That didn't happen. So I'll read a few poems from it before going on to open work of limestone. So the, uh, the title poem uh, is called This White Nest. This is wildness, breath awakening in field so it holds thirsty fire at dusk. Outside our perception of walls are ripening in snow. Our absence of transparency, we stop, stunned. Thickness of simple silence, separate. Burnt after shattering, a wound. We measure fire's link, we mouth lines, gulp dust, touch, promise, speak. <clears throat> in trees illuminated against sky, one reverse image nest and another. Each a distinct knot, but branch is joined to branch. They diverge in astonishment. You and I dwell in the dry side of grass. Appetite glow, flames, what shines? And that's one of two poems in the book that are a uh, riff on a John Ashbery poem. Um, so the next, uh, the next poem gives rise to the, uh, the cover image, which I love of the, uh, the woman turning into a tree. Uh, one of my weird, weird nature poems. Uh, it's called Tutelage. <clears throat> Learning how the trees sleep, how to do the same, stay standing, let go of leaves that have had their day. Chartreuse, greened to deep dapple, Color that blushes through as purposeful time ends, falls ankle deep on loam. My fumbling quest for tutelage and what stirs within their slumber. Maple is a breath below my window, respiration slackened, condensation on the glass. What can I learn from them of dreaming? Rustle of squirrels along limbs, the momentary nature of birds. I press my forehead into bark, strain to hear whispers, the cadence of long growth measured. They tell me in voices I'm too hasty to attend to, that this learning is not rote but ringed. A year asleep, another year and my core might ripen by slow degrees in somnolence. So in addition to the nature-ish poems and some um, uh, incantatory, every, every one of the poems I call them, uh, there's uh, some family stories and uh, some sadness as we had in the open mic. This one's called Antique Lace. My rope journey, feet bare on hardwood, slippered on tile, a breath in, breath out regularity, like quaint embroidery on linen, fragile from folding. Routine's now right, toothbrush brush and coffee cup, a wand, a tarnished chalice. 
Through backward spyglass view, I stand tiny and distant. My day-to-day is fusty with lacing of faint frost. What grounds the antique in time, but ritual? What slight shiver of leaves, semaphores loss? To think you know someone in cautious stories we all carry. Care carves open to hurt. A petal depressed, chords of pain. I feel their reverberations in my bones through slippered soles. And the last one I'll read from this white nest is a little more joyful, a little more wistful perhaps too. It's called The Sky Is, navy blue fabric pierced by pins. And the holes those pins pierce are a sieve water streams through in twisted threads. And when the water drains that way, it's like a house emptying after a party. All the good buys and hugs and see you on Fridays echoing among the crumbs and crumpled napkins and empty wine glasses. So you are left alone in your own good house, your heart hopping branch to branch, a robin looking for a perch. And should it ever, ever find such a perch? Oh, what would that be? Settling into a warm lap, a pitcher filled to brimming, or just a moment's pause, a resting to gather strength for the broad navy sky. So I'm reading from galleys of Open Work and Limestone, and um, the title relates to um, you know, sort of the dual nature of the poems that are, that are through the book. There's uh, history, prehistory uh, with limestone rock and an open work um, myth and women's work, handiwork. So the two the things are, are joined, of course, with some family stories and some winding everything together. So the poem that opens the book is called Inhumed. Water courses underground, and a handprint on rock shocks me to the nearness of the distant child, woman, man, human. What surfaces swimming upwards? That which won't stay buried rises through rocks, rough-ridden, rusty. Volume within sound, the cavern's vault reaches, a wrapped bone kit within an urn, within a box, within a crypt. Grave goods this trove is called, little amber objects to pocket. What flows unseen beneath our lives, the honored dead or clandestine horrors? I feel a grinding, fist-sized shards shifting, lodging me deeper. A close, dank touch, cave breath, a phosphorent, phosphorescent trickle, blind white forms in the submerged river, trace fossils, an imprint. This one is called November the 1st. The veil is thin, they say, this time of year. It shifts with inhaled breaths. Presence, waiting, support. Old wisdom tells us to prepare feasts for our dead. Their souls in transit need our bread, need straw will spread for their winter slumber. On Samhain and Zaduski we dance one brief breath away from their world, the crossroads as far from our homes as wispy threads can reach. What we spill, they'll use to nourish secrets. For us, candles, bonfires, cut open fruit for divination. My mother, born on All Saints Day a hundred years ago, halfway between equinox and solstice, the balance long, tis long tilted towards the darkness we're not yet ready to embrace. A moment I, I might share with her, one of the saints we children jokingly called her, but really it's the day of the souls when the haunting begins. Candy gone, we'll share sustenance, choose apples, oranges, or pomegranates, finding promise in seeds. There's a lot of mothering and daughtering poems uh, in the book, this is one of them. Rocking chair. Like worry, they say, familiar back and forth, feet cold on wood floor. Me, helpless in trying to know the contours of this small person. Eyes so black. Ancient eyes, my dragon fierce colleague said, softening. My girl, part of me an instant ago, it seems. 
in my arms, her skin against my skin, no longer pushing from inside, but stretching me in a different way. A voice of her own and a hunger of her own that I try to sate, long hours, rocking, rocking. Juice and muffins, tableside, pre-dawn, sustenance. My soles bare against chill satin of hardwood, punctuation of raised board seams, the bowed yield of rocker rails, wood on wood. My night eyes, my babies, looking at the world, hand on my breast. And what you need to know for this poem, as well, it's sort of explained, is that Alwyn is uh, Celtic um, um, uh, word, word for po poetic or artistic inspiration and also the personification thereof. And in both um, an Irish and a Welsh legend, uh, the uh, the characters, the, the heroes uh, receive, uh, you know, are enlightened with Alwyn by, by accident when they're splashed with some, some food as it's cooking. So it's called Evoking Alwyn. Why do you want to know, my child responds to the question I've posed. For me, a stammering, mumbled reply. No easy way to translate a rapture, a breeze, to put words to the flow of essence the bards knew as Alwyn. The stream is anything but shallow. It is deep, muddy, anything but clear. A current churns strong below the unruffled surface. Eager inquiries like wolf's bane repel the wildling I yearn to run with. Forget eureka lightning strikes. What I stumble over, eyes on ground that bit of grass. Word suits <clears throat> invisible among a tangle of weeds. Drops from a long simmering cauldron, salmon flesh splattering as it cooks over an open flame. My burnt thumb, tongue soothed. Dows deeper, a fresh spring, a smear of honey, sugary milk on my mouth. And like in um, This White Nest, the, uh, there's a character who runs through one of the sections um, in some kind of peril or uh, strange situations. And uh, in, in this book, she's called Lil. Poems called Sing Along. Lil was flotsam those years, never quite sinking. Maybe she landed there by happenstance. She wasn't jetsam. No hands delivered the overboard flame. When she flew on her feet, whirled with spun eloquence of fleet gear, she prefigured the bringing of birdsong, commentary written in runic, best executed in daytime, accompaniment, accompaniment dipping at twilight to dirge. Icon. I am wood, hand carved, but spirit wrought. Bite of chisel finds in me a god, demon angel, mother, upright, with open hand, offering all. And another sculpture poem called Wrought Iron Willow. The sculptor wonders where her youthful hands have gone, the delicate hands of her first sketchbook, the light touch, the fine bones and long fingers. That touch, generative of shivers. She's moved beyond that touch, but delicacy remains in the work. Strong hands now ply iron, work the iron into shapes, gargoyles and flowers, hammered or bent, strong hands, wielding, welding. The iron worked wrought to form willow branches. She is weeping. The branches are thick, sturdy, devoid of leaves. Where is the delicacy of filigree group, the graceful sweep over water? She never thought of her hands as coarse, but so it seems they've become. Her gloved wrist pushes at the bandana edge on her forehead, tamps the sweat, tears dry on her face. Back to prehistory with uh, this one called Tide of Limestone. Flow of glaciers, shifting salt in the deep. We belly crawl, gaps between rocks, tunnels, caves to caverns. Passing through walls, we face the stasis, the stuck place. Dark matter filters us, flows through our invisible nets. We leave, leave handprints, scratches, scant records. 
And uh, just before I read the last poem, I would like to thank everybody again. <laughs> Wonderful to be here. Uh, this poem is the last I'll read. It's also the last one in the new book. It's called The Whole Tall World. A column of light, not steady, but scintillating. I listen for its faint scratchiness, its syncopated silences, its airy breathing. Exhalation pours the inhalation of mountains and the sea's unceasing bellow lungs. Surf like horses that rear and mane shake, rush in, retreat, and spume a spiraling cylinder, a rising, a lifting, finest droplets hovering on the air. What tuning will bring me past static to clarity, to that thrum of silence, voices chiming, whining, a braid of sound within that space between breathing, behind the exhale, pulling the inhale into animate energy, that silent moment that might be death, but for the animal compulsion, willing our squeeze box lungs to echo ocean and breathe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. That was wonderful. And thank you again to Susan Olding for, for helping to bring Francis to us tonight. Um, wow. Take all of those images in. Um, so our second featured reader of the evening is Catherine Lawrence. Um, and I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, Saskatoon writer Catherine Lawrence has published five poetry collections, most recently Black Umbrella. Poetry has been published across the country and attracted many awards and nominations along the way. She is a former writer-in-residence with Saskatoon Public Library and holds an MFA with the from the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you uh, and welcome, Catherine Lawrence. Thanks, that? Thank you. Thank you, Francis. That was beautiful. This might need to be there we go. That's better. So Black Umbrella is a poetic memoir, and the best way for me to uh, set this up for you is to dive right in with this poem that's called In Over My Head, because I am. <laughs> My difficult truth resorts to methods found in the Old Testament, delivering a dream to my numb, drunk, teen self, images that drench me in sweat. I shiver unholy cold, haunted by my mother's eyes, her head under water, my heart thumping race from shore to the middle of a midnight black lake, my arms, her arms flailing naked. She grabs my shoulders and forces me down. I twist, buck, kick free and gasp air, wake to face a vision that feels like gospel prophecy. I cannot save my beautiful mother. Which takes me to a poem called My Beautiful Mother. It's 1964 and I'm in grade four in Hamilton on the so-called Hamilton Mountain. Everyone has left for the day, except for me, I'm sitting at my desk coloring. I'm waiting for my mother to arrive. My teacher's at the front of the room. It's a parent-teacher student interview. This is a long prose poem. I'm just going to um, begin in the middle. I hear the click, click, click of high heels announcing themselves against a hard linoleum shine, dulled and restored every day. Mr. Wheeler rises to his feet as my mother pauses, slender as a comma, inside the door frame. His eyes widen, and for a brief moment, I see what he sees. A woman posing in black heels, polished to Crayola brilliance. 
long silky legs disappearing beneath the navy blue hem of a trench coat belted tight at the waist, long sleeves, the collar turned up. Her wide smile and white straight teeth, big hazel eyes and black hair styled by the hairdresser she sees every Wednesday. Nardina, oh man, how could I forget? She's late for the parent-teacher student interview because she's just come from the beauty salon. Long after I've had daughters of my own, long after I learned how to draw boundaries around the men in my mother's life, the men who looked, the men who phoned, the men who followed, I will continue to wonder if she drove below the speed limit that day and lingered at stop signs calculated her entrance to arrive at the weekday height of her uncommon beauty. Or maybe the entrance was for me. Maybe I was supposed to watch and observe and listen, appreciate the lessons she gave me at home, how to walk and turn and smile, not slump, complain, suck my thumb. Mr. Wheeler doesn't look away. Dark shoes, coat, hair, the long line of brass buttons, the singular touch of deep pink on her lips, a faint blush rising to her cheeks as she lets him, invites him to take his time. He coughs into his fist and seems to remember why my mother is here. He offers her an adult-sized chair brought in from the staff room for the interviews this week. I move from my desk to stand beside her, inhale her hairspray, and let the sweet florals catch the back of my throat. I edge closer, my nose a breath away from the side of her powdered face. She is mine. She belongs to me, a little sister, and our father. I hear what I know. I'm a polite girl who achieves good grades, excels at reading and spelling and composition. I participate in class. I'm kind and respectful and punctual and something else. Mr. Wheeler suggests I need extra help with long division, but his words fly fast like numbers I can't hold in my head. He rolls a pen between his fingers, his eyes grading my mother. A for long legs and A plus for pointed breasts and A plus 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 for the pulse of the base of her throat, her full lips, her bright eyes as she accepts the pen he offers. I try to insert myself as the subject of today's meeting, but they've moved to a place I can't reach. And worse, I've lost her scent to something animal, something not my mother her pupils glowing inky black as the signature she scratches on the back of my report card. <laughs> You're a good audience. So many years later, I'm living in Ottawa and I'm in my first year at Carleton and I'm 19. And this piece is called, It's Not Fair to Compare, So Let's. <laughs> Two part poem, one. My mother's, sorry. My roommate's mother rides a Greyhound bus for eight hours, then grabs a cab to our basement apartment off campus. Her weekend luggage is a soft-sided, dull brown suitcase and a cardboard box loaded with fall market fruit. She unpacks ripe red apples, green pears, dark purple concord grapes, peaches firm as tennis balls, each piece washed and rinsed and more gifts, white cotton lace camisoles, one for Laura and one for me. Laura offers her bed, but this mother opts for the pull-out couch instead. That night, she treats us to pork cutlets at a diner downtown. She doesn't backcomb her thin gray hair or wear foundation to hide wrinkles that soften as she shares stories from home about Laura's father and her three older brothers. We leave together, but I hang back a few paces, 
and let them chat, hold hands, follow the long scenic route home, the floodlit Rideau Canal that will soon freeze for skating miles and miles. Two. My mother hits town that same first semester in a navy blue Lincoln Continental, driven by a married man whose other life is a wife and two little kids. He and mother show up at the apartment after checking in at a historic hotel that costs as much for two nights as all my textbooks for the year. He carries one bag, a black leather hard shell portable bar the size of a Smith Corona typewriter case. Mother unsnaps the brass locks, sets up cocktail hour beside the two burner hot plate. Martini glasses, shaker, vodka, driver, mooth, olives. Oh yes, I have ice. No, thank you. Laura escapes to the library. I sip cold tea. And mother tells me again, I'm just like my father, dull, no fun. I don't argue, I don't push back, I don't speak up. Someone in this party for three needs to stay sober, not lose the keys. <clears throat> so clearly, I'm writing about my foundational family. Um, everybody's got a complicated family. All of my books deal with um, uh, with the family. I'm I'm uh, eternally preoccupied with what makes some families tick and others uh, not. Um, this piece is called I "Can't Get the Smell of Smoke Out of My Hair." I choose this piece because I want you to know that um, my, my love for my mother was complicated, but love, I, love her, I did. I'm leaping flames, throwing doors open in the house where I was born. Where are you? I need to model a dress before the dream overheats because what I'm wearing once belonged to Emily Dickinson. We're the size, Emily and I. Oh, mother, the most famous day dress in America is a nightgown that might burst, burst bright at any moment. The living room? You died the first day of April. Over time, I've come to think it's funny, not dying, but how the living room's propaganda got the last laugh on all of us. If you hadn't died two hours before my train arrived, if your heart hadn't braked, we'd have dined together, chicken stew, a fruity Chardonnay, licked our lips, but you were sick and we liked to pretend. This is the trouble with dreams and dying. The dream roams from dark to light, while the dying go dark. Two separate piles of laundry. You sewed Vogue patterns and taught me how to model unfinished dresses. Walk the long hallway off the kitchen. Midpoint turn, pose while you pinned the hem or shortened a sleeve. Where are you? I have no one to show and bellow my dream. Twelve buttons ablaze, lace cuffs flaming, Emily's charcoal pencil, a spark in the patch pocket at my right hip. You told me, you told me, never play with fire. It wasn't me, it was Emily. Where, oh, where are you? I'm getting closer, braver. Am I hot? And I want to send this piece out to Francis. I loved your reading. And of course, I love your pieces about mothers and daughters. So uh, in, in my, my foundational family, my takeaway was um, what not to do. And so I went on to, to um, marry a man that is with me tonight. And we enjoyed 38 years of marriage and we've raised two children and so far we're still standing. <laughs> <laughs> An early evening hour inside out.
If you quicken your pace and walk and step along the park path, you in brown wool jacket, your daughter in denim, if you inhale the raw late afternoon air and lean into her voice, you might accept the hollow longing born three decades ago, the clamp and cut under medical glare, that moment her life moved outside without you. If you ask yourself, what's the bloody problem? Why the old ache? Is this not what you wanted? Has she not gone forward and built her own big life and returned to live nearby? Yes and yes and yes. And you want more, always more. Yet here she is, a young woman running errands on a hectic day off, a woman who sends a, te a text to her mother, me, I'm nearby. Do you have time for a visit while my car gets fixed? Yes, you, chosen to share the hour before the garage closes, the hour of dusk. Vespers, a word that returns unexpected as warmth in the weakening autumn light. The fading botanical scent of her hair strayed from a knitted toque topped with a nodding pom-pom. One hour set aside, enough for you to walk beside the life you carried until she crowned. If you stop looking back over your shoulder, if you accept that you miss her, even while she's with you. If you don't look ahead, you will honor all the bright and dark hours required for a daughter to reach the dirt path eroded over time by animals and humans, a path of desire cut across the green inner city park. You and your daughter walking the way women have walked and talked and ached forever, the evening's early hour, the massive dog she rescued as a pup, straining its leather lead. Thank you so much. Zoe, you have been an absolute marvel to work with. Setting up, organizing <clears throat> readings across the country <clears throat> is um, a labor of love. And when you work with someone as organized as Zoe, it's such a gift. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you to my anonymous donor. I'm so grateful. Thank you to the League of Canadian Poets. Thank you again to Francis, to all of you and your wonderful uh, open mic. That just was, <laughs> yeah, it was fantastic. So anyway, thank you again. Appreciate you coming.